Hello and a warm welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll be taking a closer look at the rise of the African consumer. The IMF has projected that seven African economies will have a growth rate of more than 8% this year, and six of the top 10 fastest growing economies in the world will come from the African continent. It's no wonder then that the African consumer market is regarded as the next investment frontier. After Africa weathered the 2009 economic downturn and proved its resilience, executives and companies who had not yet established an African footprint started to seriously reconsider. In 2010, Africa had over 1 billion people living on the continent with a GDP of 600 billion US dollars. And given the increasing population rate and workforce, GDP is set to be at an estimated 1 trillion US dollars eight years from now. By 2020, 17% of the world's population will live in Africa. And this puts the continent in the perfect position to start playing the numbers game. Although the continent has a low per capita income, the average income is growing. And even though there still may be political and economic instability in some African nations, the implementation of reforms has transformed the continent over the past few years. Investors are particularly interested in cashing in on the rising middle class of Kenya, Ethiopia and Uganda in the east, Senegal, Ghana and Nigeria in the west, and Angola, Zambia and South Africa in the south there is increasingly less reliance on traditional importing and exporting as a revenue stream and more towards country domestic demands which are greatly influenced by population size, declining poverty and urbanisation. Africa's consumer spending is predicted to hit 1.4 trillion US dollars by 2020 and retail players want to cash in on this rapidly rising middle class. Well, joining me in studio to discuss the rise of the African consumer, Martin Davis. He's the CEO of Frontier Advisory, Bill Russo, Director McKinsey & Company, and David Cook, Director at Actus Africa Limited. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your time. You. Let's just start with the African consumer. <coughs> it's obviously a hot spot, as we've seen illustrated over and over again. But in terms of income <coughs> per capita, do you think we really are overcoming that challenge? Mm, well, of course, Brahma, it's very, uh, it's very low. but. You know, Africa is what 40% urbanized, and uh, your your presenter was alluding toward that. That's similar to India. The challenge is, is we have extremely fragmented market. I mean, the, the the sort of major hurdle needs to be overcome in the next uh, decade or so is to start to integrate markets. If we're looking, we talk talk about BRICS often. Goldman Sachs set the tone of big tone that big is beautiful. The more population you have, the more progressive supposedly you are as an economy. I think we need to start to put these economies together. The map you had up shows certain countries. We should be looking at certain regions instead. East Africa, for example, is probably the most progressive when it comes to region integration. We're no longer talking at small, fragmented African economies, but rather sort of regional, integrated economies, which are competing maybe not for the likes of the bigger BRICS, but maybe perhaps the, the Turkeys of this world, the Mexicos, perhaps maybe even Indonesia's in terms of population size. Perhaps that's a best case scenario. Are we ready to speak about the African continent as regions? I had this debate last week. You've got your East African community, obviously ECOWAS, Maghreb Union, and then you've got SADC. Is that how we're starting to look at the African continent uh, in, in reality? Yeah, sure. I, I think many are looking at that when creating natural groupings where you get um, larger pockets of population. Maybe even going back just, just to this segmentation of consumers and, and the rise of the African consumer. If you look back over the past decade, you've seen the GDP per cap uh, on average for the individual African consumer rise 4.5% per year. Some of the hotspots you mentioned, like Ethiopia, are growing at, at rates of 9% um, per year. And if you project this going forward, we look at um, roughly 50% of households actually having disposable income by the year 2020. We define disposable income in excess of 5,000 US dollars per year. The reason that's important is that you find at least 50% of the spending is on non-food um, items. Um, so, uh, and I think one other thing I think that's important underneath that is if you, if you look at the individual segments, those that we call the globals are growing uh, the fastest and those are in excess of $20,000 per year. So this, this trend is, is absolutely happening. As Martin mentioned, it's really very much facilitated also by urbanization where you see higher levels of productivity um, and much higher incomes. 
financials, telecommunications, retail. I would assume that those are some of the hot spots <coughs> when trying to reach that consumer. Dave, the trends we're seeing on that front? Very much so, Ronan. I think um, you know we saw the uh, the trend in telecommunication penetration really play out uh, in largely in the, in the first part of the of the 90s and, and uh, early 2000s. Um, but that's a game that's now being played by the big multinationals. Uh, as a private equity investor, we're often now looking beyond that into sort of what are the some of the telecom services and the crossover between financial services and telecoms in penetration of bank rates. Uh, the use of ATM credit cards, and which we're seeing fantastic growth in and, and we're investing specifically. One of the trends is obviously the banking environment and mm. often when you go in country, you're presented with an overbanked situation from the local players and yet there's still space perhaps for the international players. Mm. We've seen the, the consolidation in Nigeria and in that banking sector specifically. Do you think that we're going to see that trend set across the African continent? Mm. Well, I think what we'll see is, is, is um, as we alluded to, is that the technology disrupting existing sort of business models particularly in finance. We see it very much so in East Africa now, for example. I think, again, is we see consolidation in Nigeria, South Africa, saturation. I think from a, a financial services banking perspective, it's not so much bricks and mortar banking, it's more of a technology that will enable banking <coughs> for which we say stereotypically the, the base of a pyramid sort of consumer. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, it, it comes down to a leadership thing. Look at Nigeria. Uh, in three, three years perhaps, the country's literally turned the corner, still hasn't turned it fully, but turned a corner in terms of setting their tone around fixing up its banking sector, which ultimately is the foundation of development of any economy. Let's go back to the retail space and the trends that we're seeing at the moment. A uh, number of South African players trying to push ahead there. We've got the likes of, of ShopRite, obviously, trailblazing. And then other players, even Woolworths, with a foray into the African consumer. Are they doing it right? Do you think there's <coughs> much more to learn in terms of trying to dominate this space from a, a retail perspective? Look, I, th I think from, from what we see, they certainly are picking the hot spots. Um, Nigeria probably being the top. And I think you've got Woolies, Mr. Price, certainly ShopRite, um, uh, Mass Mart, obviously uh, with their is, Walmart. Is there. And I think they're actually quite selective. You see them opening, you know, one or two stores in, in certain areas. Um, uh, I, I understand the store in Mozambique, as an example, is a big success um, for MassMart, but I think they're selectively testing the water. Um, interestingly, uh, we, we just completed a very large scale piece of consumer research, um, and one of the things that, that, that research told us was the, the demand for what we would call formal shopping. Of course, across the continent, you're probably still talking at rates of 90% informal shopping. Um, and, and as a result, if you, if you go into the Woolies or the shop right up, up in Nigeria, you see just absolutely incredible, incredible foot, foot traffic. So there's an enormous amount of, of pent-up demand for, uh, for formal retail. 90% you say informal though? Informal, yeah. Outside of South Africa, of course. Uh, yeah. Can you add your, your thoughts to, to this trend that we're seeing? Yeah, no, I, you know, the rise of modern retail is, is here with us, um, but it is very early stage. Um, I think it was in 2004 that Actus built the first modern international grade shopping mall in, in, uh, in Lagos. Uh, last year we opened the second one. That's how slow the progression has been. Um, you know, quite patronizing, I think. You know, some in the outside, uh, outside <coughs> of Africa thought, why do West Africans need shopping malls? Yeah, now you're seeing this huge demand um, for, for modern retail space by not only the South African retailers, but, but the international retailers as well, Inditex and the Zara Group and the like. But it is a slow game. So for, for the retail space, I think this is a 15-year game rather than a, a, a near-term play. Look how long ShopRite have taken to get uh, financial returns out of their early stage exploration in, out, outside of South Africa. I'm, I'm still going to push this space because if we're looking at 90% informal in, in terms of your, your shopping trends, can the formal shopping environment ever hope? You say a long-term trend, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. You're not going to overcome <coughs> that trend in the short term, are you? Well, let me tell you the company I learned of actually this morning. It's called Tian Shi. You may have never heard of it. It's a Chinese company. It's the Chinese equivalent of Amway. And it's opening across the entire continent. It's not formal. It's purely network-based. And it's selling... Chinese pharmaceutical type equipment and products through to the bottom base of the pyramid, African consumers, and it's not formalized at all. But no one's heard of it yet. 
it's almost a, a very disruptive new sort of company or a new business model coming into the continent again to take advantage of sort of this rise of you say this rise of African consumer spending. However, just one thing to add, I think is very important. We often look at Africa increasingly, and this came Bill from your report in in May 2010, just prior to the World Cup. The African the rise of African lions or African consumers. I think when one's looking at the continent through a uh, sort of almost a salesman consumer perspective, it's fantastic. Uh, profits we made and the MPNs, the shop rights, and all these we mentioned. But one must step back and look. You know, retail investments are being driven by consumer capturing strategies. Uh, perhaps from Actus's perspective, your investments are driven not by country but by project. We need to start to see countries that are more innovative beyond merely offering consumers or projects, but countries that are more proactive in marketing themselves for capital, and ultimately into projects, into consumer space. Because I'm seeing you know, investment in this country, in this continent, is not being driven by the country cell, but rather project and consumer capturing cell. Maybe Bill, just, a, to just a couple other, other comments on this. I think, I think first of all, uh, if, if you actually look at a global map of retail penetration, there's so much white space in Africa, mm -hmm. and all of the big guys are looking at it. In, in, this, in this kind of global economy, everybody's looking for growth, I think is, a, is the first important thing. Um, the second thing is retail in particular, I think, is actually quite good for local economies. I say that because it actually tends to be one of the largest job creators uh, of any sector um, out there. So I think when you bring these two things together, you will see, uh, albeit slow, um, progression on this, uh, on this path. By the way, I think the other large kind of inhibitor tends to be real estate. It's actually just getting I was going to say, property is one of your biggest challenges. Yeah, property um, in the right places. What about cultural differences? Because again, we know that you can't paint the African continent with one brush. And we look at very different cultures, even within the East African community. Tanzania differs fundamentally to Kenya and Nairobi. Ha can you touch on that, Dave? Anything? thinking on that front? And this is, as an investor, this is something we experience right across the emerging markets. I, it, it amazes me, though, how you can have such different cultural nuances on the ground, and yet the issues that these businesses in the consumer space face as they're trying to grow are identical, whether it's Brazil, Nigeria, or, or India. Um, having said that, of course, having, having an understanding of those nuances on the ground is, is critical to, to make <coughs> a successful investment of it. It's why we follow this local model where we have people from the regions operating in those regions. Um, but ultimately, I think you know, the, the, the cultural differences are be aware of them, um, be, be sensitive to them. But it's not, it, it doesn't uh, change the business models fundamentally to what we're seeing across most of our markets. We're going to come back after the break, and, and I want to pick up on language barriers because I think that could be a little more challenging. We're going for a quick commercial break. More on Invest Africa when we return. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Invest Africa. The face of the African consumer is changing. The challenge for investors is to understand the market spectrum as well as to have the ability to cater for the basic consumer right through to the sophisticated and demanding high-end African consumer. The African continent is geographically divided into 54 countries, of which 16 nations are landlocked. But the establishment of trade blocks such as the EAC, SADC and ECOWAS is making it easier to reach the goal of creating a single African market. Africa is a continent with a bright future and make sure that we can be able to grasp the opportunities and make sure that we can work together for United Africa, but also to consolidate and make sure that we can create a better atmosphere for trading between ourselves. At first glance, entering or expanding in Africa may appear daunting because of the undeniable complexity of the continent. Investors need to have an intimate understanding of the market that they're operating in as consumer preferences and regulations vary from country to country. And getting this right is crucial to the survival of any business. I think what you need to avoid, which I hear people do not want, they don't want to be treated like you are doing them a favor by coming and investing in our economy and you want to try to bring your brand of what you think of as civilization into our economy. I think you are there to work 
and adapt your style to, to whatever the economy there is, 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 is used to. But an all-important question is where should investors be putting their money? The largest growing sector will be your retail sector, which fuels this or supports these street vendors who are at the bottom end of the income spectrum. You do have the professional ones who are educated. Those are buying more sophisticated goods. Um, I think it's been said that a lot of people would sell a lot of things to Africa. People would just buy it. But I think the African consumer is becoming more sophisticated, particularly the educated middle class, which is emerging. Those are professionals who are going to be on Facebook Facebook are going to be on Twitter. We know, for instance, that the mobile industry um, is doing very, very well. I think they say over just or just around half a billion of African consumers have mobile phones. That opens up an avenue for retailers to sell goods to the African continent. According to the Credit Issue 2011 Global Wealth Report, there are 71,000 dollar millionaires in South Africa alone, and this number is likely to climb to more than 240,000 over the next five years. The needs of this niche market must also be catered for. This dynamic market will not only be a source of generating opportunities for investors, but building dreams for Africa's youth. Dimisha Mahangele, Johannesburg. Still with me in studio, Martin Davis, the CEO of Frontier Advisory, Bill Rousseau, Director McKinsey & Company, David Cook, Director Axis Africa Limited, and joining us now from our bureau in Lagos is Sili Egbe. He is the SS Consumer Analyst, uh, CIB Research, Stanbeck IB, TC Bank. Sili, thanks very much for joining us. And of course, we'd like to get your thoughts on the Nigerian consumer. What are we missing here in South Africa? What are the hot spots? Well, we've obviously seen a very strong growth in consumer spending over the last decade, and our take is that you're going to continue to see that growth, uh, you know, over the the next uh, decade or two. Uh, what's interesting is that you know the, the the trends we've seen in Nigeria are actually no different from what we've seen in other parts of uh, of Africa, even South Africa inclusive. Uh, and we, we we obviously believe that uh, I think some of the key major issues you'd have going forward will be you know, the ability for, you know, the government in respective countries to sustainably, uh, you know, continue with ongoing economic reforms because those have been, you know, the key drivers of, of uh, economic growth and, and consumer uh, demand. As long as that, that continues and sustainable, you know, I think that Africa would definitely be the next, uh, the next destination for, uh, for consumer demand globally. I think there's a consensus that uh, there is obviously the need for a new driver of consumer demand, and I think Africa could well be that, that, uh, that driver. Well, I don't want to gloss over the cultural differences. We ended the last conversation with Dave giving his thoughts. I know you've done some research recently on whether the consumer differs radically across the African continent. Care to share? Yeah, I, th I think I agree with Dave that you do have to tailor um, by the local market. At the same time, though, we find some, some pretty big commonalities. Let me just mention a couple themes. You know, one is young and optimistic. Um, the second is a level of brand consciousness and love for quality. Uh, the third I would talk about is mod I call modern taste and sophistication. And then the rise of digital. If I, if I go through those uh, briefly, young and optimistic, 51% of consumers across the continent are under the age of 20. Under the age of 30 is 70%. So you have this enormous commonality um, in youth. We asked some questions around optimism. Um, strikingly, we found 84% of Africans believe they'll be better off in the next two years. That cuts across countries. Interestingly, if there's one big difference between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, th this was it. Um, the third thing that we found is that um, uh, there is a high level of brand consciousness. More than 50% are actually loyal to one uh, particular brand. 70% to just a, a few brands. Um, uh, there is some trading off when they go on deal and on promotion, but very brand conscious. At the same time, um, re they really care about quality. Um, quality tends to be one of the top buying criteria. This was a big surprise for us. Uh, and then I think digital, um, lastly, is growing uh, enormously. Um, we found that uh, 52 or 53% are online um, every month. 25% are online daily, most using mobile phones rather than, um, 
And digital perhaps speaks mm. to distribution, which I know Dave is mm. going to touch on mm. in, in a moment. Martin, mm. are people taking the trends in the social media platforms, your Twitters, your Facebooks, seriously when you are traveling across the, the African continent? Do you feel the momentum building? Mm, I think certainly, but it comes down again to, to, to cultural linguistic issues. I mean, again, on your map earlier of hotspots in Africa, there was not one country that is Francophone or French speaking Africa. Uh, you know, that's a population of 450-odd million people in the continent, and we haven't touched upon even one country that speaks French. So I think if we're increasingly looking at sort of African consumer spending, let's look beyond the obvious, the Kenyas, the South Africa's, the Nigeria's, and maybe a tag on as a Ghana. Let's look toward other parts of the continent. What's happening in Cote d'Ivoire? What's happening in Senegal? What's happening in sort of, you know, that part of Africa? So um, I think, and that's a whole diff different language dynamic. Uh, is Facebook, is Google available in French? in that part of the content, I certainly hope so. And that comes back to accessibility, what, what, in, what, what information are the young sort of consumers um, getting, getting access to. Um, I think again, we must be careful of this demographic dividend. Yes, there's majority of people in Africa, the consumers are young people under 20, as Bill said, but at the same time is that this force of urbanization is very exciting. But the problem, I think, from a developmental perspective, yes, it's easy to sell stuff to young people. But from an urban management perspective, I think it's not just urbanization in some cases as it is slumization. And we see that across the continent. This, for me, is a very much of a great, you mentioned social, social concern. Distribution other than digital distribution. Mm -hmm. Logistically, this must be a big challenge. Well, it is, but I think it's also about mindset. So if you're a, um, a, a multinational company used to selling your, computer, uh, your consumer products through, um, through the formal <coughs> retail channel and, and you land in Lagos uh, to somewhere like Balogun Market, um, that's a whole other world that you've got to get your, your distribution model um, mindset around. I think you know, the, um, we talked about how the low level of formal retail uh, penetration, and, and that's going to take a while. So to serve these consumers, uh, this growing segment of the consumer population, well, you've got to understand and to be able to penetrate the informal markets. Now, there's some fantastic um, distribution businesses, local champions that have developed, uh, but increasingly, these are now looking <coughs> at more regional-based distribution platforms. And th those are the kind of things we get really excited about, where, where you can take a formal business platform that is really tapping into this informal cash-driven economy. That sounds like a very good business model, and perhaps we need to have a whole show exactly <laughs> on that distribution model. Isili, I'm taking it back to you in Lagos. If you were to set up a consumer-facing business after all of the research that you have done right now in West Africa, we gave you enough cash to do that. What would it be, sir? Uh, at the moment, I'll, I'll focus on, on staple food producers. Uh, in there, I'm also referring to, to beer producers, and I think that it's one area that... Uh, multinationals have been very quick to capitalize on. I mean, that industry today is, you know, over uh, at, um, close to about a three billion uh, dollar revenue generating industry and uh, represents quite a substantial pool, profit pool, uh, even within a global context. Uh, and so, uh, as as long as you know, with with sort of the the age, uh, the age age bracket uh, uh, in Nigeria, you have over fifty percent, slightly over fifty percent of the population. Uh, within the bracket of uh, about say uh, uh, zero to to about uh, 30, 40 years old, you know, and so they've been able to catch to tap into uh, that demographic uh, and, and and convert that into uh, growth in bear volumes. We've seen bear volumes grow in excess uh, of about 10 percent per annum over the last 10 years, and there's a likelihood that we can need to see sustained growth between say eight to uh, about 10 percent. Penetration in the sector is still relatively low. We're consuming roughly. 11 liters per person at the moment, and that compares to uh, a global average closer to about uh, 35, 40 liters per person. Uh, so that is one sector that I think is quite important. I think a lot of the discretionary uh, commodities are still a few years out from being, uh, I think, immediate uh, profit generator, substantially high profit generating businesses uh, in, in, in the Nigerian market, and I believe that applies to all, also other African markets. Uh, there is a focus here on affordability and necessity. So, so it's important that, you know, for you to be able to, to reach out substantially to the local consumer, your product is affordable uh, and of great necessity. Well, this is where we put ideas for our viewers and drill into your expertise. I'm going to ask you all exactly the same question. Dave, what business would you be setting up consumer-facing? You've got the whole African continent to play with. 
Oh, my goodness. Um, I think you know, uh, home and personal care products, um, brand, branded, packaged foods businesses as as consumers are starting to spend uh, disposable income in those areas. We've just seen that rise through India, through Brazil, uh, through, through the other emerging markets. And these are some of the common themes and trends we're talking about. Um, what else? Uh, quick service restaurants. Um, again, uh, challenging in some markets around real estate. But this is all about families going out and, and starting to spend that, those, those first extra dollars of, of consumer spend uh, that they have available. Um, Great, good ideas being tabled. Martin, do you want to jump just, in? Just to add to that, what about you know, Yum Foods, McDonald's, where are these, where are these, these food, uh, you know, food chain restaurants, why are they expanding across the continent? We have very robust growth. For me, the macro picture is, and look at ShopRite, um, entered into India, frustrated by regulatory protectionism, complexity, and now perhaps you know, greater thrust into Africa, where India is difficult, China is expensive, Africa is fragmented but open. And I think uh, retail groups particularly are looking for growth. And they're certainly not coming from the uh, developed world anytime soon. Bill? Yeah, I agree with Dave. Um, the, the reality is, is we're looking at a, a four to $500 billion opportunity over by the year 2020. Half of that is coming from food and non-food consumer goods. So I agree. Branded uh, home and personal care and branded food products um, are going to soar. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for sharing your insights. That's all we have time for, unfortunately. On this edition of Invest Africa, we'll be back again at the same time next week. Until then, from me, Bruno Nielsen, and my guests, it's goodbye.